For almost the last two decades, Chinese-made drones have dominated the consumer market. Now, fears of Chinese espionage have forced some drone operators to switch to American-produced models, and away from leading Chinese companies like DJI, which owns over 70% of the market share worldwide. These government bans in Florida, they're not just impacting first responders, police, firemen, they're also impacting people working at universities, so university researchers, and there's a lot of scientific research done with small drones. DJI claims that its drones are secure and points to security evaluations as proof that some U.S. critics' concerns are overblown, and state and local government entities have spent millions on DJI drones, meaning that moving to a U.S.-produced option could be both expensive and wasteful of previous purchases. The U.S. government has these approval lists or mechanisms for approving drone manufacturers. The problem is these are also extremely oriented toward law enforcement and public safety and defense because they were put together by the part, you know, Department of Defense Homeland Security. Meanwhile, the war in Ukraine has elevated the need for cheap, reliable drones, such as those in the consumer market, as a key part of modern warfare. And even during the recent attacks by Hamas into Israel, drones were used to give the attackers an advantage. Now we have small drones that you can buy for a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, taking over many of the tactical air combat roles that we saw manned aircraft performing. And although the U.S. arguably pioneered the use of drones in a military capacity, they're usually larger, more expensive, and not as easily replaced compared with the churn of consumer drones being used by both sides of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. So some militaries do use our products, but more for disaster relief or civilian-type uh, operations. That we see as a valid use case, but we do not want our products used within combat. Drones of many makes and models are being used in Ukraine, from small handmade first-person view drones to large heavy drones normally associated with filmmaking and other enterprise work. So what, what we're seeing right now is Ukraine is consuming about 10,000 drones a month. Chinese companies such as DJI and others have a large lead on cost-effective and capable drones, but some in the U.S. think this dynamic isn't permanent. There's been this question, uh, you know, different people have different perspectives on this of like, can a U.S. company compete? Like, are we going to be able to like match the drones that are coming out of China? I think it is going to be key that U.S. produced drones or drones produced by trusted allies become more affordable. The size of the global consumer drone market is around $4.1 billion, and in the US alone it's a little more than $1.1 billion, and the Chinese drone maker DJI owns more than 70% of the global market. DJI drones range from cheap to expensive depending on the model and features. They're known for being well made, and they come with great support in the form of DJI Care. We're clearly the number one manufacturer of civilian drones, right? So both for the consumer segment and for the enterprise or business segment, we're a clear leader by a very, very wide margin. Eventually, DJI was able to take advantage both of the fact that they're obviously, they're located in Shenzhen, very close to a lot of electronics, and they also make genuinely quite high quality products. They're inexpensive, they're easy to use, um, they're reliable, increasingly so since 2016. DJI pioneered small drone technology in the mid-2000s, and their drones continue to be very capable for the cost. That first mover advantage has really uh, helped create DJI as it is today. That and a commitment to innovation. Surprisingly enough, people kind of counterintuitively assume this cheaper Chinese product's going to be less reliable, but in this case, it's often not true. There's also some market incentives that have existed around why we don't have a really good Western or European competitor in this particular cheap civilian drone market. China's Ministry of Commerce has recently released export restrictions on certain drones, such as those with long flight times or certain sensors. This effectively limits the sale of these products to enterprise customers. On the China export uh, restrictions, that's really focused on trying to ensure that the drones are not being used for combat use, and DJI builds civilian products. Several states in the U.S. have moved to ban the use of DJI drones by state agencies such as police departments or fire departments over data concerns, and a federal ban has been floated by several senators that would restrict federal agencies from using Chinese-produced drones. It's genuinely worrying that, uh, that we've reached a point where people can kind of win an argument just by naming China. People are not looking at the facts as we would want them to. The facts around DJI are that we've been audited by U.S. government. We've had other companies come in and audit our products as well for cybersecurity, and there's been no threat identified.
The problem with making small consumer drones like quadcopters in America is that the price of producing them goes up because material and labor costs, among other things, are higher than in China. Around 2017, 2016, a lot of the Western competitors dropped out of the market. They didn't want to compete. They also didn't make some great choices sometimes. And even if a drone is made in America, making one out of parts solely sourced in the U.S. is quite difficult. But we've got to create the conditions where U.S. companies can win these contracts, particularly when it comes to government provision of drones, local law enforcement provision of drones, and even in our national critical infrastructure, the companies that operate in, uh, and maintain our electrical power grids, our transportation systems. I mean, DJI is a, a, a very impressive hardware company on many dimensions. They've been at it for a while. They make really sleek, integrated systems. Our basic outlook on the market is that it's still very early days. Skydio recently moved to focus on the enterprise market, and they hope that artificial intelligence can be a game changer in who can operate small drones. The opportunity that we see and that many of our customers see is much broader deployment, much more impact, and really giving a drone to everybody who could benefit from one, not just everybody who happens to be an expert pilot. Our products are definitely more expensive. I mean, our cost structure is quite a bit higher than our peers coming from China. Uh, which is why we've chosen to compete on the basis of having a product that's got kind of a different value proposition based on AI. Around 2017, again, law enforcement began buying huge numbers of drones, and they started buying a lot of drones made by uh, DJI. While some police and first responders use DJI drones, U.S.-based companies have also been creating drones marketed towards law enforcement, firefighters, and other government organizations. Law enforcement uses it for things like uh, surveillance, for uh, search and rescue, for things like monitoring protests. Of course, it's very controversial. Uh, during COVID-19, law enforcement used drones to monitor public movements. I think when you when you talk about sort of the, the non-military or non-law enforcement application of drones, there's no immediate threat to using Chinese components. But what we have to prepare for is if there is uh, a conflict with China down the road and they cut off that flow of components, then the law enforcement and military application of drones in America could be Curtailed. My name is Blake Resnick. I'm the founder and CEO of Brink Drones. We basically build public safety technology. Brink Drones recently signed a deal to send several drones to the New York City Police Department. Drones aren't anything new to the New York City Police Department, but their use has only increased as the technology has become more ubiquitous. We want to utilize this technology to complement our crisis management team, complement our, our, our police personnel, and respond appropriately and be able to respond in record time. You know, a drone could get to a location in uh, 30, 40 seconds where we're gonna have crowded streets where police are not going to be able to get there as fast. The, the impact is, is already super positive. I think the potential impact is, you know, to the story everywhere is like, could be much, much greater. There are certainly valid concerns. You know, we don't want to live in a world where we're all being sort of proactively, randomly surveilled from the air. Uh, I don't want that. I don't think most folks in law enforcement want that. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's not the reality today. I think it's, it's a possible future that we have to be on the lookout for, and we are as a company. People weren't sure about the military efficacy of small and uh, micro drones. We're seeing it in spades on a daily basis in the uh, Ukraine-Russia conflict. The U.S. Department of Defense recently announced an initiative called Replicator, which among other things aims to field thousands of small drones in a fairly short time frame. I think this is a sign of a lot of really forward-leaning sharp folks in the U.S. government, in the U.S. DOD, seeing the trends and seeing that small, light, survivable systems that are smart enough to do useful things on the battlefield are crucial for the future of, of our military might and making investments in that direction. I like the principle of replicator, the idea that we're going to look for rapid procurement authorities and, and a quick experimentation timeline in order to field unique weapon systems that can get us the attritable, low-cost drones and p potentially strike weapons that I, that, uh, I think we need for a, a conflict uh, across the Taiwan Strait. We do not have the drone factories right now to produce these systems in those quantities. They just don't exist. And we also don't have all of the requisite supply chain components that we would need in order to scale up to that production. So even if you did have a really advanced drone factory, guess what? 
we don't have brushless motor manufacturers. You know, we don't have sufficiently good camera gimbal manufacturers. Uh, we don't have companies building flight computers or radios at a competitive price point. The U.S. is just behind in this technology, and I think it's going to take Replicator, but frankly, a lot more than Replicator to actually fix this problem. Learning how to stop small drones could be just as important for U.S. national security. In many instances, the most effective way for a country like Iran, Russia, or China to attack us domestically might be to insert special operations teams which could use small drones against us. So we need to think about drone defenses not just as terrorist a threat or you know, a, dis a disruptive threat from a small-scale actor, but as part of a strategic campaign by a near-peer adversary against our homeland. Fordham Technologies aims to field sensors and a drone hunter that can help defend against small drone threats. I, I think it's just really important to understand that these drone threats have become a key part of any modern conflict. They can be used everything from lone wolf actors, single acting terrorists, all the way up through full out army scale warfare as we're seeing in Ukraine and Russia. And for both sides of that conflict, they are indispensable tools for intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, targeting, and without them, I think it'd be difficult to, to win these modern warfare. So it's, it's a real part of our modern threat profile, both domestically and in war zones. I am hoping there will be more pushes to um, develop more American and European, just generally more competitors in the space. It's not great that we've only got one company. It's less, you know, it obviously is very politically relevant as a Chinese company. Even putting that aside, it's just not healthy for the space to only have one overwhelmingly dominant company. If Replicator replicates a, a commercial procurement model, I think we're going to be in great shape. If it replicates the traditional military procurement model of nothing will fail here, it'll eventually become a high cost, low productivity uh, event. What, what we've seen early on in the history of the drone industry is widespread consumer adoption. So people basically buying flying cameras. And that's been great, but I think really the future of this industry is autonomous drones launching out of boxes, responding to 911 calls, accomplishing you know critical infrastructure inspection in an automated way, uh, being utilized in defense applications. Uh, that's, that's really where all of this is going. Any attempts to ban DJI are, are, are really um, not just damaging DJI, but damaging the entire ecosystem around drones. So there's a lot at stake here. Um, we really hope that uh, the politicians will look at the facts, actually look at the audit reports that have been done by uh, U.S. government institutions as well as, as uh, private companies that show that our products are, are data secure. One day if China says, okay, maybe America's catching up or getting a lead in this, this endeavor, and they can just cut off our components and set us back for years. So we need to think about that and to not be to not drive an over-reliance on Chinese components as we move ahead. The larger scale we reach, the more leverage we get and the more that we can lower our costs, and there's very much a virtuous cycle there. Uh, so, you know, I don't think it's an impossible mountain to climb. It is a mountain, um, but we're, we're going up it now.